Kick Many more to this door Just that so that I can do my uh, sound checks and stuff correctly and mm. editing uh, everything. So I'm just gonna, we're not really gonna do a big introduction. This is Douglas, the youngest mm. uh, <laughs> old podcaster boss. that I've had on <laughs> here. Um, and Douglas is a South African born citizen that holds dual citizenship through three grandparents that are from the UK. That is correct. Which year are you born? 1944, can you believe it? What? If you've got any arithmetic, well, most people can't add that far, but... Um, that yeah. is, that's at least 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I like your kind of arithmetic. <laughs> yeah. Just say he's over 40. He's over 40. 1944. 1944. I was a, a war baby. Um, is that when the war ended officially? No, it ended a year later. 45. Yeah, and you see what happened was my father was a, a, a prisoner of war with the Italians. He got caught at Tobruk in North Africa. What? He, he was a volunteer serviceman. He was private, I think. Um, and he was a dispatch rider because he loved motorbikes. I know that. But um, then he was taken prisoner by the Italians and he was in a North Italy pr prisoner of war camp. And um, when Italy capitulated and the Allies invaded and were walk marching up Italy and they capitulated, um, you know, they stopped running the, the prisoner war camps and he and a few others escaped before the Germans could come and round up the, all the prisoners of war and take them back to Germany. They did not want to go to Germany. And so he escaped through Italy, joined the, and, and it came across the Americans who were deeply suspicious, thought, because by that time he could speak pretty much Italian as well as, and he was dark, you know, dark hair. Anyway, they sent him back to England and, and he got, although he hadn't come from there, he, 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 they sent him to England, then he was sent back to South Africa and he was demobbed. And I was born nine months later, but then he rejoined the Air Force. And he wanted to fly, but he was too old at 27. And uh, he became a navigator, second lieutenant navigator. So he started as a private, as an, as an anti-aircraft gunner, and then a dispatch rider. And then he ended the war as a second lieutenant navigator on Aero Bomsons flying out of Port Elizabeth to catch German submarines. I don't think they ever caught one, but be that as it may. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just laughing because I invited you to talk about I know. South African politics and UK politics and now we have this whole thing of uh, uh, your father being a prisoner of war and uh, yeah, well, how that's fascinating why I was is born that? In the, I was born nine months after you got back. How crazy is that? Yeah, oh, it's a funny story really. I find that super fascinating. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's more, more politics about that if you like. No, well, uh, it is because it is South African politics. Yeah, it definitely is. Did you did the, the prisoner of war uh, mess with your father's head a lot? I'm no doubt. Well, he was uh, an alcoholic already, I should think, from what I can what I learned at that stage. Yes, um, but. Um, I'm sure it did. I, I don't know, but I'm sure it did. He never talked about it much. It was very difficult to get him to talk about it. And my mother used to tell more of the stories. But, um, but when he volunteered, because in South Africa, uh, South African army at that time was, was, to fight the war was volunteered because there were divisions in South Africa uh, between those who supported the Germans and those who supported the, um, uh, uh, the, the Allies. And in fact... South Africa could easily have gone either way at the beginning of the war because, uh, but what happened was there was a coalition government in the, in the 30s, the late 30s, um, jointly with the, what became, it was, I think it was called the South African Party then, and it became the United Party, that was Smuts, and he was Deputy Prime Minister, I think. I don't remember the exact, all the details exactly, and Herzog was the um, Prime Minister in this coalition government. And instead of calling an election on going into the war, um, which may well have taken South Africa in on the side of the Germans, um, he resigned and so Smuts became prime minister. And he, from the First World War, 
was as part of the Allies with the British. He was very much an international statesman, Field Marshal Smuts. And so he took South Africa into, into the war. But there was a lot of objection also by Brunbach and all of those sorts of organizations, and there was a lot of violence. And my father, when he, was, when he joined up, he was sent to a training camp in Potchefstroom or near Potchefstroom in the Transvaal, which is about as for crump as you can get an area um, you know, it spawned the, what did I forget the names, the Conservative Party, but then there was the Verkrampt and Verlicht arms of the Nationalist Party. So they went there, and, but, but they used to have to be, in, if they went into town from the camp, they used to have to go in groups because the people, the students at the university would attack them, the soldiers, and they, eventually they decided to take revenge. And they went up and they, it, they took the Great Hall of, of um, the Potchefstroom University and lit a bonfire on the steps as revenge for these attacks on the soldiers. That's about as much as I can remember of the <laughs> stories, but that's the story. Yeah. Crazy. Well, I think we're definitely going to get... Uh, mm. I'll make a note here that we can talk about uh, early politics. Mm. Because the whole idea today is to talk about the current South African Indeed. political Indeed. and economic climate. Mm, yeah. um, and because uh, emigration is a big discussion yes. uh, where there's a lot of people leaving the country. Yes. And there's, um, there's a lot of opinions and thoughts and ideas and emotions going around regarding South Africa. Yes. And uh, I'm very careful to take a lot of them at face value because are they educated opinions or are they feelings and uh, I'm getting you in to give me some more thoughts rather than uh, feelings but we can mix a little bit of feelings in there too because I feel that you have a little bit more of a realistic mature neutral outlook on where we are in South Africa because Douglas is an accountant so yes. Douglas uh, inevitably there is a little bit of a financial brain in there and give me the evidence <laughs> <laughs> although i'm not a lawyer so douglas is not like me where uh, uh, i jump to conclusions i'm sure you jump to conclusions but you're not willing to change your life regarding your conclusions no you need no the feelings evidence. come into it okay so uh, the first discussion will be where south africa at right now mm. And that will probably be a 20 to 30 minute discussion. The second discussion after taking a break and making a pot of tea will be to talk about uh, Brexit. As, as, as a recovering addict, um, one, uh, one pot might be enough, <laughs> <laughs> but one cup would not. <laughs> so uh, the reason why I'm getting Douglas in about UK politics is he's lived there for 17 years and uh, he is a... Citizen, you yes, hold dual citizenship. I am, I am. Yeah, I am. plus he is uh, also leaving. That's possibly the, that's the plan. Yes, uh, to go <coughs> back to the UK, and um, you would not have chosen that if you were not up to date with the whole Brexit idea. Yes. yes. So Although maybe maybe the universe is protecting me in a sense that um, Brexit is being delayed, and my departure, permanent departure, has been delayed. Um, because I always said I wouldn't leave until I'd sold my cottage. And it's not sold. Maybe I'll leave anyway, but I don't know yet. But, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to... Maybe, uh, maybe the universe is saying, wait until Brexit is over. I don't know, but maybe it's saying that. Who knows? Yeah, and uh, that's the two main topics. Yes. We might go in and out uh, mm. and around them. There might be other topics, but that is the main idea. So let's just jump into South African politics and the current economic climate, mm. zero to ten, <laughs> uh. how optimistic are you about our current situation and the direction that we're moving? Well, are you talking e the economics or the pol politics? Because the two are intertwined. So let's start with economically. How well, are we doing economically? Highly negatively. We completely... I think we're completely on a downward run, heading for a, uh, um, uh, a, a downgrade by Moody's, which is the last one that hasn't put us on a junk rating, junk status for our government bonds. Uh, some of the state-owned enterprises are um, uh, uh, already on junk status, but our bonds are not. And when that happens, the, the 
the, the, the it might be a, it could be a stimulus ultimately to the economy, but I suspect not because one of the the, the, the main drivers of the downturn in our economy are to do with the politics. So that's where it's intertwined because the, the, everybody knows what has to be corrected and Ramaphosa was, a, was, was appointed or elected uh, as the saviour uh, of the country from the years of, of Zuma and corruption in particular. Uh, although I think that's a little bit of a simplistic response but that is a common attitude. Um, uh, and I don't, and, and everybody knows what to do, but nobody's doing it. So everybody says the right things, but nobody's actually doing it. The government says the right things. Bueni says the right things. Ramaphosa says the right things. And they go off and they have um, all these international meetings and finance meetings and people promise investment and all that. But in reality, in order for the economy to turn around, major structural reforms need to have, and need to take place. And the SOEs um, need to be fixed. The SOEs? Uh, State-owned enterprises, electricity. Uh, there's a whole lot of them, I can't remember them all, but the, the big one, of course, and the, and the real risk, one of them, also the, 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 the breaks on the economy is the failure of ESKIM to provide su su sufficient power to attract industry. For example, it's, I don't know, about seven or eight years ago, there's an economic development zone called Kuecha, um, between Port Elizabeth and East London, or maybe it's past East London, I can't remember exactly where it is. I've driven past it. Uh, and they were going to put a, a major uh, um, aluminium plant there. And aluminium is one of the most electri electricity-hungry um, uh, industries. And, you know, it's massive investment and uh, from abroad. And... Um, it could, could, because of the, the problems with electricity since around about 2007, 2008, um, the ESCOM the is unable to provide the power for such, a, such an enterprise. Of course, then there was a downturn in financial problems all around the world, economic problems all around the world. So, you know, the whole investment case for doing it just didn't stack up anymore. So, the whole, you know, so, but that's where politics are, are interlinked. Um, uh, with economics and uh, or, or you know, and the economy in general, so so when you say that um, they not uh, they saying the right thing, but they're not doing the right thing. It's all. It, what it, does what does that mean? Well, and my second question that follows on to that is one of the arguments that I've heard is that they are they have to play the political game where they cannot change everything too quickly because then they lose the support within their own party. Well, so they have yeah. to play the game where they are changing, but they're doing it at a certain tempo that's not disrupting. Yeah. Yeah. their support within their own political system that yeah. then I don't know so what's your opinion on that and yeah take on that um, at the medium term budget statement when he said this that and the other I won't, I, can't go in, I won't go into all the details but he said all of these things but there was nothing new it was said at the budget it was said pre Previously, and all the things that had to be happened that that needed to take place to give effect to what he was saying, and I'm sure he knows what to do, and I'm sure a few others of them know what to do, uh, uh, um, but there's no do. So, in other words, the, the 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 government, the departments that are supposed to give effect to these things, um, uh, 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 um, don't. You know, they have the strategy and the guidelines, but they don't implement. And the huge elephant in the room, the huge elephant in the room in all of this is um, the ANC's relationship to Kasatu and to um, the Communist Party, South African Communist Party, is that they're in, and those are people are fundamentally opposed to the labor, the restructuring of the labor market that it needs to take place and the downsizing of the, of the staff complements of many of the state-owned enterprises and the, gov and the government itself. All of these things need to happen um, in order for the economy to start thriving again, and they don't happen. And, 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 and the, the reason is, is, is political um, entirely. The ANC still believes, I think they're wrong, uh, still believes that... Um, um, that they need 
Kusatu and the SA Communist Party in order to maintain their majority in, the, in whatever elections take place. Um, I don't think that's right, and it, but it hamstrings them. And then, of course, there's the, the, the factional division in the ANC and uh, what you said uh, about um, they have to do things slowly in order to, because they don't need to split. And I would venture to suggest that the best thing that could happen for South Africa is that the ANC splits. Mm. That ANC, that, that uh, call it the non-corrupt crowd, I'm sure there's some in there, but of Ramaphosa and his people who know what to do and want sensible economic, con economic policies and know what to do, um, break away. They can't maintain a majority. They will then have to join with um, another political party. And the only, way, the only one that's viable in that regard is the DA. And they would have to join to either merge or form coalitions to, to run the country. If that happened, there would be major ructions. There'd be major labor unrest. There'd be all sorts of problems. But it's nothing like the social unrest that is developing already and has been for the last few years in South Africa that is going to get more and more widespread and more and more violent if things don't change. And um, that's the sort of summary of, of, of the whole thing. Now you've got, but just that's a, very dark. <laughs> well, yes. <coughs> it's not all negative. I don't want it to, be, I don't want it to yeah. sound all negative. And but I it's just, realistic. But I think it's realistic um, because there were some ifs in there. The ifs are, are where the positive comes from. If this happens, or if that happens, or, you know, if they split, if they restructure the labour market, if they fix Eskom, if they let South African Airways slide, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they do it. But at some stage, some government is going to have to have the balls. I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to use words like that because it was on. Um, where was it? Oh, that's what I saw it on television. Some. Uh, serious discussion. If, if Prince Andrew can talk about his That's, relation it, with pedophiles yes. on BBC, Correct. then you're allowed to say bold yes, so, on uh, so, uh, my silly little podcast. Yeah, a lot of it depends on whether <laughs> whether um, it's the government having the balls to face down the unions, because mm -hmm. whatever reforms take place um, w will lead to general strikes and things, and the answer is just not to give them, and I hope to God that the, 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 the strike for SAA, that the, that the government don't force SAA to give in uh, uh, to the unions. The only way this has got to end is to face the strikes and face the, the discomfort, just like going back to British politics in the 70s, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, when Thatcher took place, she faced down the unions, they had their strikes, and, the, and then they, they did the structural reforms and Britain started growing economically thereafter. The same thing can happen in South Africa. And I must also put in a disclaimer because, um, you know, you talked at the beginning about uh, emotional responses and a lot of the responses on our politics, and I'll give you some examples in a sec, in our politics are um, uh, emotional responses. And... Um, uh, and, the, and the other thing I want to make a disclaimer about is, and I, and I do that too, uh, the other thing I want to make a disclaimer about is um, my own biases. I, I have biases, clearly. Uh, I was totally opposed to apartheid the whole time that was going. I was not a political activist. I was a, a viewer or a voyeur, if you like, from the sidelines, but I read loads of stuff. And um, at the end of apartheid, when it was over, I was living abroad, and I voted in the first... Did I, I don't think I got to vote in the referendum. My passport had expired, and I, could, and I for, left it at... I could have got it renewed in, in time to... Anyway, I didn't. But I voted in the first election. Okay. I was going to vote ANC. Um, because they were the ones that ended up, you know, well, that brought about the situation um, uh, uh, to end apartheid. Give them, give them nationalists the, and, and the clerk is due. He went against his people and his government and his own views and all of those things and brought, you know, started the negotiations. Yeah. So it was a peaceful ending. I thought it would be a revolution. So no, I'm not always right. Um, and. So, but I thought to myself at the time, you know what, the, op the potential opposition parties are all in disarray. Um, I've got to vote um, uh, for the opposition. I can't vote for them. I'm so pleased today that I did that. Not that my one vote counts, but the ANC um, uh, allowed 
the corruption to take place. The, and the ANC, I think, is also endemically corrupt, as is the South African government. And, and, I, and, and I'm sure it didn't only start with Zuma, although Zuma took it to the next level, as mm. a mutual friend of us, ours would say. Um, and he really climbed in and milk, you know, drained, drained the economy of trillions of rands, probably. Nobody really knows. So, yeah, there's a confirmation bias in there. I was an in, in, in instinctive supporter of the ANC at the beginning. Mm. Um, I have changed my mind, and I'm pleased. Uh, I mean, but I was also a founder member of what was then the Progressive Party in 1959 when I was a teenager, and um, when it formed as a split out of the you know, old United Party. So that's a sort of bit of a background that, that obviously brings some sort of bias. But I try, as an accountant and as a business person, although in the last 10, 15 years of my career I've worked in non non-profit organisations, but um, I try nevertheless to make rational responses. Yeah. And so uh, I, I was on a negative thread. I think the, the, the outlook is really negative because I don't think that the ANC has the, 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 the uh, um, can't say the backbone. I don't think they're able to do what's necessary, even though they know. People say, oh, they don't know, a bunch of ignorant, what, what, what. Yeah. That's not true. They, there are people in there that know exactly what to do. Um, uh, and well, including think... Ramaphosa. But they, they are unable to do it because of the factionalism or they believe they're unable to do it because of the factual. However, there are some positive things. Sorry. So we're gonna. We, I, I'm gonna make a note there that we're gonna get to the positives. Yeah. And there's. Um, I, I just think. Um, poof, I think a lot. Uh, changing the situation from listening to you. It feels like that um, it's not only the government that's got to stand up and start implementing change. It just feels like the businesses also have to realize they have to take a knock and that they have to support the government in helping them to make these changes. I think that's correct, and it, I think they will. Because it's... if, And some businesses are going to fold. Some businesses aren't yes. going to survive. Um, and it, I, it, I get the feeling... A lot of people are sitting here, and I know that from my background, a lot of people complain that there's a lot of people in South Africa with their hands out waiting for the government to provide them with uh, income, with housing, and with work and everything. But then I also feel like a lot of the rich people are like, I'm waiting for the government to make changes. And it's like the people, I feel like the people don't realize the government changes if the people force them to make changes and there's a there, i feel like there's a lot of people that need to stand up a little bit more businesses need to stand up a little bit more and whenever you stand up to a government there is losses uh, and in some countries unfortunately at the moment there's uh, lives that are being lost in some countries the people are getting incarcerated for standing up mm -hmm. uh, some people are getting pepper sprayed and tear gassed and or, for us, it's like public protected. Yeah, and for us, it's uh, you're going to lose money. Yes. Uh, but we have to lose money in order not to lose more money. It's the Correct. same as war. We are losing lives so that we don't lose all the lives. Yeah, and it's the same with strike action. If you resist a strike, for example, like for the current SAA one, they say, well, it costs you 50 million rand a day. Well, you know. The, what we're asking for is a lot less than um, 50 million a day for three or four or five days. Why don't you just pay us? But the answer, and the way the business will look at it, the answer is that it's a capital investment in curtailing your costs, if you like, ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it costs them a few hundred million rand of lost revenue um, to save whatever you know a few million a year but it's a few million a year not for this year and next year so it's a few million a year for the lifespan of the organization because the base for the next increase comes lower and there's absolutely no justification in this country for uh, above uh, 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 inflation increases especially when the, all these, org these state-owned organizations and the government departments are, are way overstaffed I, I saw an article yesterday I think about Oh, today, this morning, um, South African Airways has almost a thousand employees per aeroplane. What? 
uh, British Airways, which makes a profit, and various others, I, I can't remember all the figures, have in the region of 150 to 200 employees per, per aeroplane. So, I mean, just so that's a measure of overstaffing. But uh, I, I went on a sidetrack. I was, let me just yes. try to get back to where I was at. Oh, yes, I think the arguments that you just made about business and all that sort of thing, I think a lot of, I think there's a mixture of rational but also emotional arguments in there. And I want to try to bring it back to the rational. And I think that, that business is standing up to an extent and the business puts their money where their mouth is so in other words um, south african business is not investing in south africa if you look at them all the big companies are establishing themselves abroad um, the jsc what the jsc 100 companies are awash with cash which they're not investing and the government has to come to the party for them to change their mind and you know um, you know, we have nasty words like, or phrases like white monopoly capital and radical economic transformation and all of that sort of stuff. That's just flim flam. It's, it's just uh, uh, um, emotional responses to peop by people who are unable to form rational arguments to, to support whatever point of view that they're making. And it, but it creates an emotional froth and a resentment. And then, of course, there's other fears like... You know, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 expropriation without compensation that are rearing its ugly head. Now, I, I personally don't think that that's a rational fear, but because I don't see that um, uh, any government can willy-nilly take, no matter what they change, can't change happens to the constitution, can willy-nilly take away people's assets or property um, without compensation and except in, except in very particular circumstances, because it's against our basic fundamental constitutional rights. But the fear is that the government, you know, the emotion response is the government's going to take our property. They're not they're going to take our property, they're going to take our business, et cetera, et cetera. So there are emo these things that happen, you know, when the government talks about this little thing, it creates a, a, a ripple all around the world. And the investors say, why must I go there? You know, it's penny, South African economy compared to the rest of the world is penny ante. Why must I go there? I'll wait and see. And we, they've been waiting and seeing for a long time. Since in 2011, I think it was, the, um, uh, 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 the ANC approved at its conference the, what's it, the NPI? Plan, the, the, the plan that was developed between the government and a whole series of businessmen. And they all come and they go and do these things. They, you know, they do this, these jobs for free. And they developed a plan. It, was, it's, it must be gathering a lot of dust now because n nobody did anything that of any of its implemented any of its proposal. That's just that's when it started. Mm. You know, when I said that it's a lot of talk, and it's uh, uh, and very little do. So at some stage, you must get to the positives. I, and I wanted to bring it to that because there is no quick answer to yeah. are we in a great place. Yeah, we are uh, not in a great place. So That's the quick answer. The quick answer is we are not in a good place. And we can see no signs of spring. However, there are some signs of spring. We don't see them because there's, nobody's wearing orange jumpsuits yet. We know that. That's, the, that's what people say to me on a regular basis. And I say that's an emotional response. Orange jumpsuits, meaning they, uh, in, in they're the, in jail. They're in the Armageddon movie yeah, with they're uh, in Bruce Moore. Willis and Ben Affleck going to no. the moon. <laughs> they're in, they're in Poles <laughs> Moore. to the asteroid. No. Okay. And I'm sure that business is waiting in the wings to step up the production of, yeah. of orange so jumpsuits. So meaning that there's no politician in jail yet? Yes. And uh, that's why if there were politicians in jails, that would, would be the official sign that... Yeah. that we it, are in a good place right it now. Was a, it, was a, it would have a huge symbolic effect. So I think, but there are positives. You see, and this, this is my own bias comes in here, is that um, um, Ramaphosa is one of those people that likes to do things, I believe, um, by consensus, and he likes to talk and, 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 and get in a consensus and agreement and get stuff, and make decisions that way. And there's a lot of merit in that. He also is a man... I think, who likes to lay, lay foundations, and that's where my bias comes in. I believe that to fix anything, 
you've got to start with the fundamentals. And in, in my very, very early days of, of, of recovery from addiction, I was at a talk and I got, and I wanted to do an analysis, I had to do a talk, a presentation to everybody that was there on a Sunday morning. Um, and I had started with a foundation, you know, you throw concrete and you start laying a row of bricks and you lay around it. So the only trouble was I was so frightened and so nervous. Uh, that I couldn't get out of the analogy of laying rows and rows and bricks and it takes a little while before you lose and after a while you lose the attention of your audience and I just looked and I, and I didn't know what to say I went blank so I stopped and it, was a, it took about five minutes I was supposed to speak for half an hour so in other words I, but I was trying to say that if you if you want to have a sound anything you got to start with a sound with a with sound foundations if you don't want your house to fall down you better make sound foundations and that and Ramaphosa is doing that if you consider how um, and, and if you really want the detail of it you better go and read uh, R.W. Johnson's book um, Can South Africa Survive? He wrote two one a few years ago and the other one in the late 70s Can South Africa Survive? Then it was apartheid and um, and he was actually optimistic, but the book is in 95 percent of the book is a detailed analysis of the extent of the corruption that is in not endemic. And I use the word endemic advisedly. That is endemic in our society, and it's everywhere at all levels. Um, and I don't exclude commerce, and I don't exclude individuals. How many of us have not been stopped for speeding? It? And handing over a hundred rand to avoid to avoid the fine, that is correct. And if you want to fix corruption, it starts there between you and me. I've done it. I know I've done it. Um, but now I live in a place where they can't deliver the summons, and I know the law, so um, I don't pay them anyway. But uh, so they can send me a summons <laughs> if they wish. But um, but the thing is that that the point is is that this come. Corruption is endemic. Uh, he, uh, uh, Johnson, go, in his book, goes in this, it's very dense, in this detailed analysis at all levels. Not, you know, we think emotionally, our oh, Zoom has stole all the money, and, to, and he certainly facilitated You probably find he's got nothing. But, um, so he doesn't, because he doesn't want to end up in jail. But he facilitated this whole thing uh, on a grand scale. But it didn't start with him. It started way, 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 way back. For example, um, the arms deal. The hoary one that's been going on and on and on for God knows how many years. Mm. Think about the arms deal. I mean, the amount that Zuma skivied out of that was minimal in, to, you know, in the scheme, of, in, in relation to the size of the contract. Um, but the ANC, all its life, lived financially on hand to mouth, you know, handouts from this government, that government, and they had little businesses, and I'm sure they did a lot of drug running and arms smuggling, all sorts of stuff, you know, like the IRA did in, in, in Ireland. They did all of those things, to live, but they were always economically on hand, living from hand to mouth. But all of a sudden, come the 90s, um, and they're in government, the ANC has a, a, a substantial investment arm with lots of money and lots of investment. Where did that come from? Now, I don't know the answer to that, but, the, but it, the corruption starts. Maybe individuals didn't profit from the arms deal by what the few things that we know about, but maybe the ANC did. So in other words, it starts there. And you know what? If I'm at the bottom of the, of the rung in the ANC, and the ANC is scolding this money, and I see the high ups living fat on the land, um, you know, Range Rovers and all that sort of thing, I'm going to try and take my cut. And, I, and that's, what it mean, that's what I mean when I say it's endemic. And that's what um, Johnson said in his book um, in detail. And he, he gave example after example after example. So. It is endemic. So, but in, in order to fix it, mm. no, because now I'm talking about positive, remember, I was just giving a little background. Um, in order to fix it, you have to fix the foundations. So you have to fix the organizations that have been, to use a South Africanism, state ca being captured. You know, that's mm. the, if I say an organization has been captured in South Africa, um, everybody will know exactly what I'm talking about. If I say that in Europe, they'll say, what, what do you mean? Um, 
So they have to do that. So in other words, you cannot prosecute a case if the police don't investigate it. Yeah. And, the, and the prosecution authority is corrupt and won't, and won't prosecute it even if the, key, the police invest it. So you know, if, even the police inv investigate and bring a prosecutable case to them, they won't prosecute it while they're corrupt until you fixed it. So the positives are... Um, there's been uh, 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 an inquiry into the civil, into the security services, and some recommendations that have come out that haven't all been implemented yet. The, the personnel, a lot of the main personnel, have been changed. Although I'm sure the organisation is still organisations are still corrupt. Um, there's been changes at the head of various police departments and organisations, um, and that takes time for them to each one of them having to fix that if they've made the right choices. We have. Uh, uh, we got the public protector wrong, but that was the, I think, that was, um, I can't believe some of the things that she's done. It's very difficult to believe, um, but it was one of Zuma's last appointments. Um, although, how I, it was, you must have been lucky. I mean, you got it wrong with Tuli Madden Saleh because there she was, um, uh, you know, I'm sure it was a political appointment, and there she was saying, well, you know, I'm going to take this job seriously. Mm. Sounds like Thomas a. Beckett and uh, whatever king it was at the time. You know, um, Thomas a. Beckett took his job when he became Archbishop of Canterbury seriously. Mm. And, uh, and he spoke truth to power, and so did Tully Madden Salem. But, uh, but he struck it lucky with Kalani. I mean, it was a, there was a very open selection process that went on and there were a lot of shortlists and but he has the prerogative the president has the prerogative to appoint one of the flaws in our constitution by the way it doesn't specify the process by which the president must make these appointments to all of these organizations so the president can do it on a whim i mean you can take it to court and say it's unreasonable etc but um, we don't specify in the constitution, so he had the right to appoint. So that was her. But but um, um, Ramaphosa is busy fixing the tops of those organisations, and um, Tomoyani has yeah. been fired. Um, the, the 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 top people in in the, in the prosecution authority has been fired. The there's a new person there who's a well, I believe is a Rottweiler who runs the prosecute prosecuting authority now she's established a, 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 an investigating unit along the lines of what the scorpions was but not the same in that unit but it takes time to staff it she's established it but it takes time to get up and all of these things take time um, etc so there's a lot of positive things around all of these positives on the foundation but it's just, just not fast enough yeah but my, my which is an emotional response yeah well my concern at the moment is, from what you say, is that if he doesn't get re-elected, then what? We cannot think about that. Yeah, but I'm because, just... Because um, we, we can't think about that. Um, it's just that he's changing stuff. Yes. And this is the fuck up but with politics. Like, he has a second election oh, that he wants to win. No. So again, there's a tempo that he can yeah. operate at that he keeps the support internally, yeah. but he generates support externally. Yeah. But a lot of the changes will only really take effect uh, in the second term once these things are Well, that are may growing. well be, because he's getting his foundation right. And then they, I said that... But then there are... Then they, sorry, I'm going to interrupt mm -hmm. you there. Then there are people such as myself mm -hmm. willing to gamble my life on something that might or might not happen in four, five, six years from now. And I think that's the sad part is that... That's, I, I don't know what your arguments are for uh, leaving the country, but my argument is I've hung ar around long enough in the hope that things will change. And uh, I was born in the 80s, so I grew up with the rainbow nation mm. and i'm still waiting for all the bullshit that they were talking about that's going to come into south africa of the harmony mm. and the cultures living together and the this and the this and the this and it's like fuck it's not happening and i don't know if i have the patience for my lifetime yeah to hang around here and i know it's that's the emotional part but it's also the People like ourselves, we have options. Yes, you and I have options. Not everybody does, of course. You know, so if I didn't have the option, 
I would be like a bull and I will bite down and I will push forward and I will try to like help. Yeah. I have been helping since mm. I've been here. Yeah. Uh, I just feel quite alone yes. sometimes uh, within the societies and circles that I move. And uh, from what I see from people in power, and I mean power, it's easy to have power over the average person here because the average person is fairly uneducated. They come from no running water, maybe not that much electricity. So to have power over them is fairly easy. And the average person that has a little bit of influence, they just don't give a fuck, you know. So yeah. we have the high organizations and the government institutions that don't... It's just, for me, it's just, uh, it's quite overwhelming. And it's, for me, it's just sad to think that, fuck, if whoever continues to water the plant that uh, Ramaphosa is uh, planting, then the stuff might happen. But Somebody if he might dis- kill him and Mabuza but becomes if, president. If, if he disappears, what then? If he disappears tomorrow and Mabuza became, general, uh, became um, uh, president, then, then I suspect, unless he's changed his tune, uh, you remember what happened in Pumalanga, uh, it, um, then downgrade in February is, is, is 100% certainty. Um, it's not a certain 100% certainty now. But, um, but I mean, what you've said, a lot of that is emotional uh, uh, as well as serious stuff. So in other words, a decision to, to leave... Is, it's quite easy for me to make and for you to make because we both have the op- have the basis of uh, the option to do that. M- I'm coming to the end of my life. I'm 75 years old. Fortunately, I'm very fortunate. I mean, 75. I thought we established 45 earlier. Well, I, I've got to tell the <laughs> truth, eh? And yeah, but unfortunately, I'm healthy and, and, and active and, and all of those things. And so there's no immediate need from a health point of view. So moving to the UK, I'm going to get better looked after in my old age there than I am here. And I don't have that much amount of money, much money to, 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 make the, to make those choices. And the other thing is most of my family are there. And I love kids. And I've got lots of... I have 11 nieces and nephews. And I have 11 great nieces and great nephews. The oldest of... The youngest of which is uh, about to... Well, in February, he's going to have his first birthday. And I've got... So I've also got nephews in, in, in Holland, so some of them are in Holland. So, so I have a pull to go there, and I'm familiar with it. Mm. I'm very mindful that in the 80s, when I left, and don't get me wrong, I didn't make, I made a conscious decision to leave many, many years before, and I never quite got around to it. My addiction was carrying on and all that. And then I got the opportunity, and I went. Um, I like to say that, but, but I, I was in the mindset to, 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 to leave. I was in, of the mindset because um, um, I thought there was going to be a revolution. I thought the problem was insoluble despite the fact that we made, but well, it was later in the 90s, um, there were solutions to Ireland. I thought that was an intractable problem, just like I think the Middle East is an intractable problem. So I was wrong about the revolution. We did come to our senses and that's one of the the positives from Johnson's book and his writings and one of the positives is that South Africa goes has a history of going right to the brink whether it's economically or in terms of society before it then changes direction but it eventually rises to the occasion because we're a strong resilient people etc it's you know all mm. those usual things so I may, I'm conscious that I'm really really wrong and if I were your age I might look at things differently, and um, um, but I'm not, and so um, <laughs> I look at and I hear about national health insurance it's not going to happen for a good few years, and the government hasn't got the money, and I and I ask the question why don't they affect the state med- health system that exists that's it's completely cocked up, and and, and under resourced and under everything why how if they can't make that work the government I mean when I say they how are they going to make national health work? But there's a threat to me because there's a threat to private medicine in, in terms of the proposals. And um, you know, as I said, I'm not getting any younger and I need my private medicine mm. to keep me alive, perhaps. And I pay for it with you know, medical insurance. We call it medical aid in South Africa. Um, and I pay for it. That. So, I mean, I was wrong before, so I could be wrong now. However, I'm now 75. You're much younger. 
if I were, if I didn't if I had the option to move, I would think three times about it. If 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 I were uh, uh, um, in, no, at your age. However, if for example, I mean, you don't have children, but you are married. You might have children, or you want to have children. I would not bring up children in this country. Absolutely not. I would leave. If I had the option, that would be a factor in going. Yeah, so Emotional or rational? I don't know. Yeah, so I think, I think a valid point there. Um, I had this discussion with someone yesterday. So I asked him, would you, do, would you stay? Are you staying? And I asked him, are you ever going to have children? And they're like, no. <coughs> so I'm like, if you were to have children, would that change your decision in staying in South Africa? And, it, and they had to uh, like have a serious think. Mm -hmm. I think what makes my situation also different is that I'm, I'm married to a foreigner. Uh, that, that's your uh, option to move. Well, not only that, it's... There's a difference when, with me moving to my wife's country as opposed to two South Africans that were born and raised here. They've never had anything to do with the Correct. outer world. And they now immigrate to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. I've lived, I met my wife in international waters. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we've been living in international waters and we were trying South Africa out a little bit. And um, it's only 50% me that has a home year. Mm. But even the home year, it doesn't feel like, this is the thing. It doesn't feel like home. I, I left in 2008 mm. and I came back in 2012 for a year. And this is the thing with the home I have. So Greenpoint Stadium didn't exist. Mm. That was for whores, prostitutes, and drugs. Mm. You went down that area. Now you have this beautiful stadium. In the wrong place. <laughs> That's my bias. Why is that in the wrong place? If you look across from Bloberg or from Robben Island, and you see that thing, it's an eyesore on the, on the landscape of... of um, um, I'm very proprietorial about Table Mountain and the mountains. I've climbed them all, except if I speak, I've never been up there um, as a kid. And we walked all over the mountains of the peninsula, so I'm very biased. And that thing is a blot on the landscape. Per se, as a stadium, stadia go, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, you know, it's an attractive yeah. build, but it's in, it was in the wrong place at the time for that event, for the World Cup. It yeah. should have been um, somewhere in Athlone, somewhere like that. Hartley Vale could, should have been redeveloped or something like that. Yeah. So for me, it's uh, I came back... Emotional bias, not rational. Yeah, but fair enough. <laughs> You're allowed to have one. Thank you. Um, so when I came back in 2012, mm. it's like uh, um, things are a bit different. And, and, there, and there, was a, there was a train then, or no, a bus to the airport at that time when you came back and a four-lane highway all the way to, all the, way to the airport. Mm. Sorry, six-lane highway all the way to the airport. Some of us paid the price for that in terms of screwed up traffic, but yeah. it was lovely when it was finished. So it just everything feels quite different here. Mm. Um, it's like when I lived in London, uh, I lived there and they were busy building the mm. Olympic Stadium. <laughs> mm. And... Uh, they were busy developing a lot. So everywhere mm. you went, it's mm. like roadworks, roadworks. Yeah. And then I left during that period. Yes. And now if you go back, everything's done. done. It feels slight, slightly different. Yeah. You know, everything's like established. And yeah. But because South Africa is a developing country, uh, constantly developing, mm. it's part of the third world countries yeah. with first world elements. There's always stuff going on, and especially I feel here in like Stellenbosch, where I was born and raised. It's like this little Platteland Dorpy that just keep on. It keeps on evolving, and uh, it keeps on getting a different feeling. Even Strand, Somerset West, Gordon's Bay. Mm. You now have this fancy little restaurant next to where you live, mm. which is supposed to be in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, so I come back uh, from overseas, and it just doesn't feel like. The place I grew up and it's yeah. like fair enough I can move four hours away to Plettenberg Bay or Nice now but it's like but that's not my home mm. so the reason why I'm leaving is not so much uh, the political climate it just feels like Stellenbosch doesn't feel like my home mm. uh, it's too busy it's too developed we have a lot of rich bastards that even more rich assholes driving around uh, half of them probably in debt <laughs> and they don't own their own <laughs> their fancy cars but it 
you know, I don't know, it's just very weird that you live in a place that doesn't feel like your home and then you have this clout of politics and economics hanging over you and it's like, fuck, do you really, like, what's the point? Yeah, well, I th- you know, like I said earlier, <clears throat> um, I never have, well, I wasn't a political act- activist, I never have been, and I'm not now, I'm a voyeur in terms of I watch what's going on. Mm. However... I do take it personally. So in other words, it's like the theft that's taken place, the the grand larceny in South Africa now, the corruption, I feel like it's me personally, I've never been affected by it. The constant tension with crime and all of that sort of violence and all that sort of thing, I've never ever come across it and I've never been affected by it. Other than occasionally I've had to reroute my route to wherever I'm going. But the, even that, not that often. So I've never, but I know that it exists and it constantly, but it feels like it's happening to me personally. And I believed in apartheid. As a white person, you, you were protected in a lot of ways because this was a system that was biased in favor of one particular race at the at a ever increasing price and depending on which of the other races you belong to. Um, and so, you know, People would, I mean, people I would talk to would say, well, it doesn't affect me. I, f- I believe fundamentally, and I think that's playing out in, in, in our society today, is that all of us were affected by apartheid. It was uh, a, a thing that was immoral, um, uh, crazy from an economic point of view, and all of those things, it was just completely, it was wrong, and it was violent. In order to keep it going, it was violent. Or there was the threat of violence, as I say, I never experienced it myself. But I believe that it affected me and all the white people, even if they weren't involved in it face-to-face on a day-to-day basis. It affected all of us. It created a mindset. And when apartheid ended, it released an, an entitlement from those of those who had been downtrodden. And now they're trying to downtrod down tread us so um so what i'm saying but i feel it personally and whatever is going on the corruption entitlement and all of those things rubs on in me even though i'm a um, i call myself an observer but i'm a voyeur um it, it rubs off on me and i feel a part of it and i don't want to be a part of it so that underneath everything all the other things is 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 a reason for leaving as it was um 30 odd years ago Mm. so uh, and I started writing something when something really upset me and I forget what it was. And I never finished it. But it starts off as, cry the beloved country. Again. With apologies to um, Alan Payton. Because that's, he wrote that in the 50s. And it was a searing, searing, searing book. And that, apartheid had hardly been, it had hardly been institutionalized at that point. Mm. But it was there, of course, but it had hardly been institutionalized. But, um, and, and now what we've got is, it is so widespread, you cannot believe this corruption. Mm. It, and, and to expect Ramaphosa to come and wave a magic wand and it all goes away, it is impossible and it's an irrational and emotional view. It cannot be done like that. Now, just think about it. Now, I'm an accountant, so I have an understanding of some of these things. In order to take a person, somebody who negotiated a contract with Basasa and took a kickback, for example, um, you know, a million rand a year or whatever it was, was one of the ministers, I believe, according to the books and things that you read. To, to process a case against that person, first of all, you've got to have police with the capacity to, to investigate it, but it needs a detailed forensic investigation. So what I'm saying is you need um, PwC auditors, you know, one of the big four international auditors uh, from the finance side and, and a few Weber Wenzels and whatnot on the legal side. Um, you need them times 10 or 20, plus the David Klatsos, people who do more physical type forensic investigations, about a few thousand of those. We don't have them. Never mind, the police doesn't have them. The country doesn't have them. So, but to, to set up a case, to bring it to court, a winnable case, takes hours of painstaking investigation. Multiply that by many potential subjects. And I believe they will never make a case in terms of this corruption against Mr. Zuma, for example. However... 
I and, think, and we're going to finish on that, however. Yeah, okay. However, <laughs> given the Shabir Sheikh case that happened when he was convicted 15 years ago, and given Zuma's regulate, uh, 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 wriggling and all in between, that case, if he goes to, to jail for that 500,000 or whatever it was, ran fraud, so be it. Let him go to jail. Forget about the other big case. Go and put your effort into investigating all the other one, all the other people. He's he's got his come up, and it would be nice to get him for the Guptas and everything, all that sort of stuff. But if he goes to jail for that, it's a bit like the Americans in Chicago in, in, in between the two wars, the gangs and, and 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 Al Capone and all that sort of thing. Probably participated in, or did, or arranged. God knows how many murders. They couldn't get him. They couldn't prove anything. Teflon man. They got him for tax. We've got Rottweilers in the tax back in SARS now, and they're re busy rebuilding it. They have units that specialise in doing this sort of thing. So, Mr. Zuma, supposing he was funded by all these people. Who paid the donations tax, never mind the income tax? And he got this funding because of his job, so it's associated with his employment. Did he pay tax? And there's a fundamental thing in our tax law. They don't have to have a provable case. They just say, your life, we do a lifestyle audit, your lifestyle and the way you're living is not, con is not concomitant, concomitant with your income, your declared income. So we assume that you must have had this amount. The tax on that is this. Here's the assessment. And it's up to you. So it's the one part of our law where you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. So as far as tax is concerned, they can put people in jail for tax. But they can certainly kill them financially. They slap on these heavy assessments, and each one of those people has to do the investigations and provide the documentation to prove that science is wrong. That... I hope, Mr. Kisswitter, I hope he's listening. I hope that that is what he does. He's the right sort of guy, I believe, to do that. Mm -hmm. And I believe he's re-establishing. He's been busy cleaning out a lot of the dregs. And I believe he's the sort of person who re-established those, what the public protector calls the rogue unit, to, to deal with those sorts of things. I mean, the reason the rogue, rogue, rogue unit was trashed mm -hmm. And it was a sustained campaign with the security services in connivance with the Sunday Times. And they're, 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 I was a huge admirer of, of, of their investigative reporters until this lot came out. The whole thing was, but I think they were duped. But um, the whole thing about this whole thing was about, because these people, this unit was on the brink of bringing in the illicit tobacco trade. And bringing them into, you know, charging them and 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 and, and uh, with customs evasion and all that sort of thing. And those people were, if not relatives, they were friends of the political establishment. And it had to be, it had to be squashed. Mm. But that would have been political interference, and you can't do that. Yeah. And I talked about the flaw in our constitution in terms of the election, the appointment of various other people. Um, um, of various heads of various departments, Section 9 institutions, the police and all that's the pre president's prerogative. That's the flaw is that there isn't, it's not defined how the selection should take place. And Ramaphosa does it pretty well, you know, mm -hmm. openly. Uh, but the other flaw in our constitution is proportional representation. Mm -hmm. Now, all my life I've had an instinctive opposition to it, mm -hmm. but I've never had the rational argument, and we see it playing out here in South Africa, the members of parliament are employees of the political party. And the boss man zoom in, he says, jump, they jump. They do not want to lose their jobs. Most of them are unqualified to earn a, a, a living, never mind, uh, um, except a menial living, never mind the million and, or million and a half that they get by being MPs. They're going to toe the party line. Yeah. Fundamental flaw in our constitution. They are not accountable to the, to the people. Legally they are, but in reality they're accountable to their party because their party can hire or fire. Yeah. And you wanted to break at that point. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I, you know <clears throat> my, my... And we haven't touched on shitloads of stuff, but I have to remember all the things about all the positive side of things. There's a whole series of fundamental things that have been done. Yeah. And listen. maybe, just maybe... They'll let South African Airways go and face down the unions. 
Yeah. I'm not anti-union, don't get me wrong. I absolutely think mm. they have a place and they're entitled to form whatever association they can do. It's a fundamental human right. However, the law, as it was in England in the 70s, is biased against in their favour. Mm. It gives them... But one of the positives that's there is that the law has been passed to have secret ballots now before they go and strike. Or secret, if not a ballot, they may have watered it down, I'm not sure. Or if not a secret ballot, at least to canvass the, the members before they go and strike. It's not a decision made by the coterie of managers within the union. That's a step in the right direction. One of the positives that um, Ramaphosa and his government have brought in. So it's an, another positive there. Sorry, I sidetracked again. <laughs> Love it. Mm. Yeah, listen, we're not gonna we're not gonna have the whole discussion in an hour. No. Uh, plus, uh, most people like absorbing everything you say. It's uh, you need a brain that uh, actually listens, so you can only present so much information at the Indeed. same time. I would just, you know what? Like, um, I've been watching now the World Cup and the bullshit around winning it. How it's helping patriotism and the feeling of South Africa and all of that and for me uh, I'm a big advocate that it's all fake and it's all bullshit it's like it's a uh I, I, I would disagree with you that I think it is positive but let me just finish yeah, my yeah, statement yeah, yeah. I think it would do more for the country to see a symbolic figures such as Zuma go to jail than win the World Cup mm. I think that would do. That would give me personally more enthusiasm for the country than winning the World Cup. I understand that, and, uh, and, then, and because a lot the of people Cup, hold that Winning view. the World Cup doesn't change anything. No, because no. it's symbolic. It's symbolic. Where it was symbolic when but when Malema, when, when, sorry, when Mandela walked onto the rugby field in Cape Town in when was it 1997 or whenever yeah. it was. Yeah, I think it was 1997. 95. Uh, 95. I was watching from the UK and I was in tears. Yeah. That was symbolic. That one, and, but fair that, enough. That was an almost all-white team. Yes. This team is the Rainbow Nation. Almost. Yeah. Not quite, but almost. Mm. It is a symbolic thing to give us hope in a very, very dark time. So it is symbolic. Now, understand, and I agree with you, that it would be a wonderful symbol for somebody like Zuma to be put into an orange jumpsuit. Absolutely. But it's impractical given the capture of the various organizations that have to bring that about without any presidential or political interference. And I'm sure Ramaphosa could pick up the phone and say, what's her name, Batoe? Um, it was a Sheila, is it Sheila? But I forget now. Uh, but the head of MPA and the mm. new head of the Hawks, say he could put political pressure onto them. But one of Zuma's defenses it was cocked up. It was, it, was, it was a sham. It was a scam. But one of his defences was political interference. And that is why the original uh, um, arms deal case was thrown out on the basis of false tapes and things which took years to be brought into the public. And, of course, they were proven to be false mm. and fake. So there's a shitload of fake, fake news going on. So, but by political interference, and, 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 and Ramaphosa, of course, of his position, has to be squeaky clean in that regard. And, I mean, look what happened with a measly 500,000 rand donation from the one person, which I'm sure he didn't know about, um, and the public protector going on that. And, and it's not going to go anywhere. I, don't, I can't see it. It's irrational, so it can't go anywhere. It's unreasonable and irrational in the scheme of things. So I can't see it going anywhere, but it's enough. It's a taint against Ramaphosa, so he's got to be, he can't interfere politically. He's got to leave these people that he's put in place mm. to do their job. Yeah. And to produce, as I said earlier, to produce winnable cases in court takes a huge amount of detail painstaking. Yeah. You can't just say, he, you know, that check was forged. Or you just can't say that transfer. You've got to produce the paper trail of that transfer of where it came from where it went, and the, you know they were covering their tracks, all these people. Where it went and where it ended up. Yeah. And you have to prove each part of that transaction. It does not, cannot happen overnight. And we simply do not have the capacity, the forensic capacity, to produce that kind of that level of evidence. So, so what I'm saying is that Azuma or Elk ending up in jail as a result of all of this is 
at this stage is impractical, it's wishful thinking. It would be hugely symbolic, I agree. Maybe try his, one of his sons or one of his nephews. No, no, fair they, enough. They're, they're closer to the action. Listen, was I it... I wish. Was I would it, love to see Was it. it wishful thinking to try and capture Al Capone? N yes, it was. In, until go. they put him in jail for tax. So there you go. Yeah. I think, listen... And it doesn't matter. The, the but, but having said all of that, and it's wishful thinking... The arms deal case against Zuma is a winnable, provable case already. And it was like that 15 years ago when the case was thrown out of court because yeah. of fake, fake information. And remember, there's a prosecutor who's due to retire, who is not going to retire because he won the first one against Shabir Sheikh. Yeah. And he wants to prosecute this one, and he's going to prosecute it. He's the one that's going to do it. His name's Billy Downer. It's scheduled for February, unless the last appeal that he's making against the appeal of the appeal of the appeal back to the Constitutional Court is whatever. Yeah. You see, I mean, remember that Zuma had unlimited funds when he was president, quite wrongly, and the courts have said that eventually. Um, and he's got to pay back the money, but he ain't got it. Um, like he's got to pay VBS for his mortgage loan, but he ain't got it. So there's lots of little things. That, but that case is scheduled for February. Okay. And it may not happen February, but it will happen next year. Yeah. And it's a winnable case. Let's see. So it's ready. Let's see. You can go to jail for that five, half a million. <laughs> Love it. You know what's fucked up is my thinking is like... Um, uh, uh, was it the Oscar Pistorius case where they were like, uh, uh, oh, which was the case here in Stellenbosch, uh, the one guy? Oh, that the, the, the boy that killed his family. Or something, but like, or, or, or even was when I was at university, yeah. like 11 or year, 12 years ago, there was this guy that murdered his girlfriend. Oh, but yes, I remember the, him. But then the, the yeah. police contaminated the yes. area so badly that it, they couldn't convict him. And yeah. I... There's a few things like that that's happened, yeah. which like when you say there's a case happening in February, I'm like, yes, that's a, th there's real options there. Real options. If, and it's the end if, of the if road. If they follow the guidelines that's set out on that how case, to go about. And I'm like, please don't fuck it up. Please don't fuck it up. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. You know, right don't me. contaminate shit. Don't come now. But that, is a, that is the evidence. It's based on the evidence that was accepted by the courts in 15 years ago. In the yeah. Shabir Sheikh case. I think we should finish Certainly. it there because we no. can we can go on for another yeah. hour and a half. Oh, easy, easy. Um, and our time's also running out in the studio. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because uh, things are going to get busy uh, a little bit later. Yes. Uh, we're going to finish there. Yeah. And we're going to decide if we do Brexit after a, making a pot of tea or Whole are we pot. doing it uh, on another day yeah. where we can do a longer discussion on yeah. it so I, we're going to consider that in a second i think that um, the south african political situation is far more complex it's um, far more detailed there's far more and it's closer to home for the bo for the both of us yeah. and so it takes a lot of time so for me like um i don't know if uh, anyone's listening listen, i never know if anyone's listening to these podcasts mm. but um if anyone's listening and, and even if they do listen do they listen to the whole thing or are oh, they still course. present but <clears throat> like i sat here and i'm pretty calm about mm. everything and here and there there's a, a bit of emotion coming up yeah i don't get emotional anymore because i've decided to leave mm. Um, it's like when you decide to divorce or break up with your girlfriend yeah. or quit your job. Mm. Prior to that moment of making the decision, you fight, fight, fight. And yeah. there's a lot of emotions. I'm sure some people might be listening and they get quite worked up or they have strong feelings. And if I don't look like I have many of them, it's just I have decided yes, that I'm I going know. and... Uh, I've given South Africa a really good shout. Mm. You know, my, my last four years has been dedicated to getting people out of townships into mm. employment. Yeah. I've tried working with NGOs. I've tried to involve the government. Yeah. I've tried all facets from all cultures and yeah. all backgrounds. And I've pushed really hard. And I feel like I've, I've done all I can. And uh, I've reached a, a logical conclusion that to have children, uh, to have them closer to my wife's family 
it's a better decision yeah. um, and etc etc so for me that's the reason why there's not that much emotion during your discussion yeah. but like a year or two ago there was this guy called Mr. like I don't know his first name I think his second name's Poe Yes, and he, he wrote, wrote the book. Yeah, and I couldn't read the book because I saw how much it upset my father. I'm yeah. like, it's going to upset me. Like, I don't even uh, read. There's half a dozen of those books around now. I've read a lot. I haven't read his book, but I've read a lot of them. It's uh, and I, I probably didn't read his book for the same reason that you didn't read. I it. just felt like uh, I I will become murderously angry, yeah. and I don't want to. And what I realized five years ago when I returned to South Africa from Europe is that I can't read and I can't watch local news mm. because it really disturbs me. It, I find the same. It, 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 it puts so much emphasis on what's wrong. And it's mm. like what's happening in Johannesburg is not help, happening in the streets of Stellenbosch. It doesn't mean I should ignore what's happening there, but it's just by focusing on all the shit that's happening mm. in the country, it doesn't really have an effect on what's happening here a murder in uh, um, I don't know in Bloemfontein mm. is a murder in Bloemfontein yeah, it's not it's a murder not, in Stellenbosch yeah. um, it's true. but so I've been very removed it's been spiritually uh, and I don't like to bring this in but it's like spiritually I have to accept for myself that I'm a sensitive soul yes and uh, I cannot uh, rationally read news without having all of this and stuff. And I have the same problem. And I've had to I've step back. That. I yeah. read a lot of... Listen, I'm very up to date with yes. international yes. politics yes. and news and things yes. that's happening around the world. Yeah. So, as am I, actually. So if yes. there's an article on The Guardian or on any of the other news agencies about South Africa, I might read it. Yes. Because it's or even they have a more uh, independent look no, at I, us. I try to read the Bloomberg News on South African, which is more economics, but yeah. uh, no, or finance type news. But I, I, I try to read those. Yeah. Articles. So I've I've been very removed, and I, so this discussions and conversations like this I like because then I get the filtered version of yeah. you've gone through the uh, <laughs> all this stuff and you mm. give it to me in a nice way. But um, yeah, I feel I feel. I feel for people that staying here Me too. Uh, because it, it's it's tough, you know. It's uh, and it's going to continue to be tough, and it will. I just think it will be forever tough. I I find the German story fascinating, where you have a lot of shit that happens in a short space of time, and somehow very quickly, not very quickly, but how long did it take after the Second World War for Germany to become economically? Okay, again. Yeah, it's a, I don't I can't remember how long, but it's, but they, they had the, the Marshall Plan and stuff like that, and you know, and the and the Berlin blockade and the, the airlift into Berlin and and John Kennedy saying, "Ich bin ein Berliner," yeah. saying that we will support Berlin. So a I massive like amount of money and effort went in, mainly probably from the Americans, into Germany to get it up and running. Why? Um, Would you think that Well, I, I think it, it made a lot of sense because a lot of the wars around the world these days, there's no end game. So in other words, so you win. You know, you, yeah. you, you, you get rid of Saddam, you know, Saddam Hussein or, or Gaddafi. So what do you do afterwards? There, isn't a pl there doesn't appear to be a plan. Maybe there is, but there doesn't appear to be a plan. Um, uh, Europe was decimated, first by the Germans and then by the Allies completely and to make it viable something had to be done and that was the end plan the mm. only people who could do it yeah. were the americans so they had to do it i feel like and i think they did it right like, uh, bringing that up but yeah. it's just um it's a sidetrack but well i think i'm gonna have to reformulate mm. my what i'm trying to say mm. it's just that w what germany symbolizes for me in that regard is uh moving on from a difficult past yes well i think to bring it back to south africa that if there were palpable progress, all these roadshows that Ramaphosa has been having around the world to attract foreign investments, etc., etc., um, despite the roadblocks like you know, compensation without, you know, expropriation without compensation and, and various and National Health Institute and various other unaffordable things in the way, that money will come pouring in when there's some sort of 
maybe it's, it has to be a symbolic thing like, like Zoom had been put in jail. When something like that happens and when we've been through and, and, they've, and there's a real progress made with Eskom because that's the biggie for anybody investing. Is there going to be enough power for my business? And, and, and there's real tangible, visible progress in Eskom that money will come. It's been promised, but I don't think it's going to happen unless a little bit more progress is made. Yeah. And that brings it back. So in other words, I think people will be ready to support South Africa economically and financially in lots of different ways out of this black, the, the re instatement of the black past, mm. you know, in other words, cry the beloved country again, um, to, to out of that will come out of those ashes, but there has to be some tangible, some do, as opposed to just say. Yeah. And, and, and I'll summarize the situation of South Africa for me. You made the decision to go, I've made the decision to go. You're unemotional about it now, I'm still emotional about it, and I still think of what I'm losing. But, but going, there's lots of things. You know, I can't say gutful to, to a Brit. I have to then explain where the meaning comes from and loses its impact. But I'm a little bit dumber than you. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. I don't have emotions now. Yeah. But in six months you or will. a yeah, year yeah. from yeah. now, when I'm in the street yeah. and I want to express myself and nobody yeah. understands me, I'm going to have my troubles yeah. then. Yeah. We all but it's, uh, there so will be regrets. But, but I think I summarize uh, it comes from a quote from Shakespeare. Um, and it doesn't mean South Africa is a bad or horrible place, because it isn't. Um, and like Denmark wasn't. There's something rotten in the state of Denmark. So you could rephrase that. There's something rotten in the state of South Africa. Mm. And that is what I feel. And that's why that's what I've got. There's lots of reasons why I'm going. It's, and it's not just the one. But that uh, fundamentally, that encapsulates it. So you can yeah. end there if you like. And I think we're going to end there because mm. it's uh, 11.30 just mm -hmm. at us and mm -hmm. uh, we've uh, used uh, our hour and a half almost to talk about uh, South Africa which I thought uh, we're going to split into three different yeah. <laughs> topics <laughs> so we're going to have to come back these, uh, these things feed on themselves I thought I'd, I'd dry up after about 20 minutes <laughs> uh, I got you because I knew you wouldn't <laughs> Yeah. So uh, yeah. uh, we're definitely going to do this again. Okay. Yes, I'm quite happy. I'd love to. Yeah. Um, I uh, I would appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we finish, we finish it on that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great. <laughs>